Hi, I'm indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera, and in this episode of Fantasy Lore and More, we have Kristen Artis, and she's joining me to talk about her book, Smoke and Light. So welcome, Kristen, and let's talk about Smoke and Light. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, Smoke and Light is my debut novel. It's a romantic YA fantasy set in a world where magic and science meet, and these modern royals are facing off against daring rebels. So I like to say it's it's a great book for fans of Shadow and Bone and Shatter Me. Um, it has some dystopian vibes, but it's very much a romantic fantasy. Oh, that's cool. I still haven't read Shadow and Bone. Don't come after me. I have I, I <laughs> found right. the book on Audible. Like apparently I bought it a while back ago, but I well, for some I don't know why I haven't listened to it. I really enjoyed it. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I really liked it. I think I think I haven't listened to it because I bought I have so many audiobooks that I just didn't see it and didn't realize that I didn't <laughs> listen. I think that's all it really is. Because like you're not gonna scroll through like three thousand audiobooks, which is what I have. That's you know, amazing. you're just you're just gonna go back through the last bunch that you've bought. So if I yes. picked it up on like a sale like last year and bought other things on sales and didn't get through all those, just like so it was about two hundred books. Very, very quickly. And I I do audiobooks through the Libby app from the library. Yeah. And I love it so much, but they kind of keep me in check, right? Because they're like, you can only have this for 14 days and then it has to go to someone else. I'm like, great. Uh, but ebooks are what get me. My ebook library is ridiculous and I don't do as well with reading ebooks. So I tried to make a list one year for in December and I had to stop because I it was getting too long and I just had way too many books. Yeah, I have a lot of ebooks too. <laughs> it's a problem. It is. It is. It's a problem though. A great problem. It, it's hard for me because like I write on my phone often. So like I'll bring it up and then I'll be like, oh, I didn't I need to write this thing down. And then I'll just write my own book <laughs> instead of whatever <laughs> I was gonna sit there and read. <laughs> but at least with audiobooks, like there's no temptation to do that because you can't, <laughs> you can't yeah. make an audiobook. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's just different. You have to just listen. Yeah. So <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I don't know. I'm weird like that. It's a small screen. I just focus better on it. I don't know. Yeah, I can see that. And you can I, hit the also, little I keep notes on my phone a lot of times. Yeah, I'm in the early stages of writing, um, and my characters start having conversations, which is how I usually start. Yeah, um, I just I pop open a note in my phone and I just write it all out and then come back to it later. Or you can hit the little like microphone button and like talk it out. Like I don't do as well with that. I've done it before and I do have some um, for what I'm working on now, but it's usually better for me if I just sit and type it out. Yeah. For, for me, like I do a combination of typing it and talking it just because like if it's dialogue, like it's, I feel weird typing the dialogue on my phone. Like, because it's a phone, like, I feel like I need to be speaking the dialogue. I don't know. Like, I don't have that problem when writing on a computer. Yeah. Like, it's only on the phone that my brain goes, no, oh, this is weird. Like, what are you <laughs> so doing? That. Conversation should be spoken here. Exactly. It doesn't happen on the computer, even though there's now, you know, we, now there's dictate functions in, like, yeah. Microsoft Word and Google Drive, you know, Google Docs, like, on your computer. So I could speak it out but i feel weird doing it on a pc like <laughs> but on the phone like, i don't know i'm weird <laughs> i like it no it's great it's great that you know like that connection in your brain and that like this works better for me on the phone and this works better for me on the computer i like that self-awareness is good no it's weird because sometimes you like need to dictate and you're like well, i have to be on the computer and yeah it just the brain is like no this is where we type <laughs> no I don't know. Anyways, let's come back to smoke and light because we're not here to talk about like my weird brain and like things it makes me do. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Um, well, if you want to know a little bit more about it. Yeah. Can, um, so the, the tagline for it is a kingdom at war, a search for missing memories and a tangled web of love, loss, loyalty and lies. Um, the story follows my main character, Kara, who is desperate to leave the medical wing and restore her missing memories that she lost after a brutal rebel attack. So she's dealing with the responsibility to her kingdom as the future Savannah and is kind of distracted by reintegrating into her life and 
um, you know, reconnecting with her fiance and her best friend and how you rule a kingdom that you've forgotten and all of these things um, in her turmoil. And as she's dealing with this, she's haunted by this growth in her dreams um, that's calling to her. And she thinks that finding this is going to be a key to uncovering and restoring her memories, but venturing beyond the city walls to find it is an act of treason and it's um, in rebel territory. So she's dealing with all of these conflicting emotions and um, desperation. And, you know, she's been through some pretty intense traumas. And so she's a little more impulsive maybe than she would normally be. Um, so I'm sure you can guess where she's headed, uh, but she uh, has to decide how much she's willing to risk and uh, what's, what the worth is for her memories and how do you, um, who do you become when you can't remember who you are? Like what choices are you gonna make for better or for worse? Uh, along the way. And then once you kind of figure out who you want to be, <laughs> how do you reconcile maybe what you've done or didn't do to get there? And that's Kara's journey in a nutshell. It's a lot oh, of wow. <laughs> Yeah. So you said she's the future Sovereigna. Sovereigna? Yeah. So what? what is a Sovereigna? Yeah. So basically she's a princess. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, she is engaged to the r current ruler of Anlon, the city kingdom that she lives in. So um, a sovereigna is basically a queen. Um, she is essentially princess consort at the moment that the story picks up. I see, but she doesn't yeah. remember any of that because of some trauma from the rebel yeah, attack. She, uh, they got her good. I'm guessing the rebels got pushed back, thrown <laughs> out because they're not they didn't mention them other than the attack. I'm guessing they're not yeah. there, still causing yeah. problems. Well, well they're, I mean, they're still causing problems, but they're, uh, th so the the situation in Anlon is interesting because it's sure. about two years before the start of the book is when the civil war broke out. And so these rebels okay. kind of attacked and then the kingdom divided and they're trying to, you know, figure all this out. So they have mm -hmm. some stability now, um, but there's these walls around the city. So the city itself is safe-ish, but you go outside the city and it's very much like, uh, it's probably going to be a problem for you. I see. I see. Yeah. And like, what, what, what was the rebels? What was their beef? What were they <laughs> rebelling? What did, what did, what were their, what did they want? They just have very conflicting and differing opinions about how Anlon should be run um the rebels their family uh the family that runs the rebels are um, were close family friends of ramsey who is the sovereign of the Anlon. so it was one of those situations where things were really good they were close friends and then all of a sudden they're not anymore and it ended very badly so um I they see. have some differing political opinions that became an issue there was some personal drama going on that became an issue and it all just kind of escalated and snowballed into a very terrible messy situation that has affected Kara and everyone else um and you kind of get to explore that with her throughout the book uh, and just figuring out um her role in everything and mm -hmm. Um, you know, forming your own opinions about things as she kind of explores all the different aspects of it and kind of relearns her kingdom and what she uh, what she thinks about all of those things. Um, and, you know, what she thought before, what she thinks now and like kind of marrying the two together. And does she still like Prince Charming? What was his name? Ramsey's <laughs> <His name's> Ramsey, <laughs> or, yeah. or did she does she find out that he's some horrible person who's not what yeah. she thought? So, see, the thing is, what's really fascinating to me about writing a book with uh, memory loss as such a prevalent trope is that every person's perspective of a situation is different. And, and we kind of see this as readers, too, you know, like no two readers are going to have the same experience with a book because they're coming with their own perspectives and different, you know, things that they've lived through and things that they've seen, other books that they've read and all these different things. And so when I'm writing this, I'm very much aware that no two characters in this book see the situation exactly the same. They, you know, they're looking at, this is what my experience was with this thing and Kara hearing their different opinions about everything. And then um, also like, you know, at, at points like, D determining what she figuring out what she remembers and then also taking everyone else's um, 
stories and the things that she sees in her kingdom and kind of forming a new opinion or, you know, new because she doesn't remember her old ones um, around that and moving forward from there. So it's really fun for me. Um, and I think it's fun to read too. I've heard that it is um, for her <laughs> to just, you know, discover herself and discover her kingdom in a fresh way um, without kind of without all the, the perception she had before. It's all very new. And like, what do you think now, you know, with not having the personal experiences that you had, well, not remembering those personal experiences and all of that. So it, it's fun. I like it. No, it sounds interesting. Do you want to read an excerpt? Should we, so we can sure. hear yeah. Car, Car in her own words? Yeah, let's do it. I'll read chapter one. So this okay. is Smoke and Light, chapter one. <clears throat> and this is all from Kara's point of view, by the way. The book is a single POV, all from Kara's side of things. <clears throat> one more step. All you have to do is take one more step. It was a lie. This hallway alone seemed unending as I shuffled forward on bare feet, the chill of gleaming black tiles seeping through my skin with every step. I had no way of knowing how far I had left to go. I couldn't even tell if I was still in the medical wing. If I could feel so lost within the palace annex, I couldn't imagine trying to wander through the palace itself. But one step seemed doable when everything else felt insurmountable, so lie or not, I kept repeating it. One more step. I had to get away before anyone realized I was gone. I couldn't stand to go back to that stifling recovery room. They'd promised I would be released from medical last week. I refused to wait for permission anymore. My legs swayed as pain flared in my head. Squinting against the harsh overhead light, I reached to brace myself against the wall as I pushed forward. I was tired of the limitations of my body and refused to let them hold me back anymore. But as I stumbled into the wall in my next step, I knew I wouldn't make it to my room. I didn't even know where it was. Its location was blank, like every other important memory I should have had but didn't. 19 years old, and all I could remember was the past three months. I gasped against another stab of pain. My knees buckled and I slid down the wall, gripping my head through thick brown hair that would do nothing for the pain. As my fingers glanced across the shaved strip, I kept covered. They brushed over the raised scar hidden there. I winced, unwilling to dwell on it or the circumstances that had made the surgery necessary. Not that I knew much about it anyway. Pills. I had to take my pills. My hand shook as I blindly searched my pockets. When I came up empty, I groaned, dropping my head against the wall. Had I left them behind, dropped them along the way? This had to be the most disastrous escape attempt in Anlon's history. A heavy sigh rang in my ears, followed by the familiar clink of pills against glass. Looking for these, I squinted my eyes open, defeated. My best friend stood before me as I'd expected her to, pill bottle in hand, brow arched, her angled bob barely brushing the shoulders of her red dress as she stared down at me with an unimpressed frown. Only the soft waves in her black hair surprised me. She usually wore it straight. I assumed I had the style and change to thank for my chance to escape. It must have been why she'd been late for her regular visit. Rather than speak, I held out a trembling hand. Camila immediately dropped a pill into my palm. I grimaced and swallowed it dry. Thanks, I said as I slumped into the wall and waited for the medicine to bring relief. I closed my eyes, having no desire to watch Camila take in how awful I looked. I hadn't bothered to braid my hair back, let alone brush it, and I always seemed to wake with sunken eyes on the mornings I struggled to remember my dreams. Add in the sheen of sweat covering my skin thanks to this latest episode, and I was sure Amila would be ready to bundle me back in bed at the first opportunity. You should have waited, Kara, she tried it, carefully settling in front of me on her knees before tucking her hair behind her ear. Dr. Jensen was going to release you today. She said she would last week and the week before that. I blinked back tears. Pain still lanced through my head, or maybe these were tears born of frustration. It was hard to tell anymore. I can't stay in medical anymore. Not one more day. It's been three months. I've recovered enough. I just want to go to my room. Please. Emila stared into my eyes, observing me in her quiet way. They all looked at me like this, too long to be polite, always searching my face for something I couldn't offer. I wasn't sure they'd ever find what they were looking for. With most of my memories lost since the attack, I couldn't give myself what I needed, let alone anyone else. I'll take you to your room. My heart leapt, but before my smile could fully form, she held up a hand. But I'm calling Dr. Jensen there to look you over. Camila, I groaned, covering my face. The only thing I wanted less than that was to return to the medical wing. She'll already know you're not where you should be. You just left. Did you think no one would notice? I shrugged, folding my arms. I wasn't focused on that part. I just wanted out. Amila scoffed. I mean, you didn't think, because if you had, you would have called me to help you break out of there. What if at least brought you some shoes? She met my wide eyes with a smirk. That's what friends are for. Besides, I'm sick of spending all my time there, too. She sniffed. It smells terrible. 
I laughed, warmth filling my chest. It faded fast. I didn't want to bother anyone. Or maybe, she argued, you're tired of needing help all the time, so you didn't reach out to any of the people you know would drop everything for you. I shifted uncomfortably. She wasn't wrong. My skin itched with the need to take care of myself. How could I do that if no one left me alone long enough to try? Am I that transparent? I just know you. The words stung. I didn't know myself, let alone her, no matter how desperately I tried. All I had to go on was what I'd learned while stuck in my recovery room. It's okay to need help, Kara. All we want to do is help. I breathed out slowly, not hiding the way my breath and body shook. Throat too tight to speak, I nodded. Camila relaxed, patting my leg. I hadn't realized she'd been so tense. She stood, offering me her hand. Then let's get you to your room. I let her pull me to my feet and steady me as I swayed, blinking back the dizziness. She remained steadfast against my side, an unmovable wall of support holding me upright. Despite standing a few inches taller than her, I sank my weight into her warmth. You were going the wrong way, you know. Amusement lined her words. Soon you were heading in the completely opposite direction. I have to laugh. Maybe I was taking the scenic route so I could see more of the annex than the minifoline. Mila's eyes flicked down the hall. I followed her gaze. The only thing I could see was a dark wooden door, a single camera glowing a soft green above it. Everything seemed quiet here, outside of us. Her voice went as tight as her smile as she turned back to me. Trust me, there's nothing scenic down there. Yeah. Well, that's the first joke. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she's, like, plotting her escape. <laughs> Are they? I guess they're yeah. watching her. I guess like to. I guess you know if you're a princess, on, you have like, guards and things. Super protective detail, and she doesn't love it. <laughs> Even I guess I guess that's I guess whatever happened during the rebel attack didn't leave her afraid or anything. So she she goes back and forth. You kind of get to see. She's she's really interesting because you see her push through and like see some of that that fiery side come out where she's like I am going to just like release myself from medical and I'm gonna go to my room now uh, but then you also have times where you see that she is afraid of the rebels and she's afraid of the situation um, that that she could be in if they were to be near her again um, once she starts getting a little bit more of that freedom and finding herself outside of the medical wing and outside of like her sweet manix and all of that. Um, but yeah, she's definitely highly protected after what happened um, because it was a very uh, brutal attack. That word brings to mind one thing in my <laughs> mind. Oh no. Okay. I, so it's I not that. No, 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 no. Okay, no. Because when I hear brutal, okay. like there's a four-letter word that starts with R and uh, ends no, with no, no. E that oh no, that no, like no. comes no, no. to mind. Like it's either that or torture or no. like it was some it kind of physical sexual that. assault. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I mean by brutal. I just mean like so bad that she was really injured, and this is you know three months after the fact, and she's still recovering. Um, that thing where it just was a uh, physically a lot but no not nothing like that okay okay no. not that brutal okay okay so she was injured in some way yeah, so like you know she's she's was bad off enough that in the next chapter or two you see like she had a, a wound that she's still doing physical therapy for in her shoulder and she's got had to have surgery um and she's got the, the memory loss she's dealing with. So there was a lot of brutality, like violence, but not, uh, one, not anything shown, and two, not not on the uh, a sexual assault side of things. Okay, okay. That's good, because that's good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it no, sucks that she was hurt. Right. It's like, this is a YA fantasy, and right. I, I'm very much a... I like to say I write hopeful stories, um, even though there's definitely some harder things that happen. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't shy away from the the trauma side of things. There's a lot of mental health rep and trauma recovery in this um, in this book in particular, and then the rest of the series. But right, it's uh, definitely done with a, a hopeful undertone. It's still very PG thirteen, very YA. Um, I don't get too dark. I don't think I would not call this dark. Um, 
some okay. people like it, not me. Because <laughs> like brutal brings to mind like dark, very dark story. So maybe that's not the right word for it. Well, I mean, I think it just depends on, again, like your perspective on things and, yeah. and what your perceptions are and what other things you've read and, you know, all of that. To me, like a brutal rebel attack is just very violent. And I think anything that puts someone like Kara in a, a recovery room for three plus months is pretty brutal. That's true. So you said that there's like magic and like tech and like technology in there. Yeah, like, yeah. Let's talk about that because sure. I'm curious. How does that work? Yeah. So uh, honestly, the world is one of the fun things about this book. And it's also one of the things that I think throws people off if they're not aware of it when they come into the writing. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a world where I like to say it has old world heritage meets modern flair. So they have a lot of tradition and, you know, uh, old world culture that they have in their kingdom. Um, but because there is this magical forest called the Siridan Forest, and that's actually where Kara was born. So she has this connection to this sacred magical forest, um, which is one part of why she's looked up to so much in her kingdom and so she has this connection to this magical forest but they also have two other forests surrounding that forest so amlon is very much like a exporter of like they harvest wood they do all this stuff with the wood right and so they have regulations in place to protect the seared and forest but they also harvest this magic and so from that magic they're able to make things mm -hmm. that um, are a little bit more advanced. There's also elemental magic at play in the world. So um, it comes through different bloodlines and um, the diamond kingdoms are these five city kingdoms that are kind of isolated in a peninsula. So this is my world behind me on this wall. Um, but they have on one side a very large mountain range that makes it very difficult for anyone to come over either direction. And then the rest of it is like a peninsula. So these five city kingdoms are allied from their ancestors long time ago, allied together. They share resources, they help each other out. And a lot of their ruling families kind of have ties to this elemental magic. So you have um, Firth, which is on the cliffs by the water, and they have like water, a lot of them have water magic over there. Um, there's wind and earth, and then you have fire, and then you have Amlon, that's kind of this, where the book takes place is the city kingdom of Amlon. And so they have a Sirodin forest, and then they also have um, some family, ruling family ties to different magics. That's not quite as, um, there's like one family there had like uh, electric lightning type magic. And so they were, that family would give of their magic for the good of Anlon. And so they have like these magic powered batteries, essentially um, things like that, where it's the magic has fueled the scientific advancements along the way. So you have, um, Think the, like the wood pulp is in so many things, and that was one of the things I got the research for uh, while I was writing to kind of see like what all could they make, <laughs> and you know it's in inks, it's in um, different fabric things. Wood pulp is in like la um, tablet screens and all kinds of stuff like that, and so we have doors in the annex that have um, like magic security imbued into them so it's like Kara can touch the door to her suite and it kind of reads her palm based on the magic and allows her entry um, but they also have things like keypads that are created from a seared in wood and technology mixed together and so uh, the the electricity magic the seared in wood like it all kind of combines together to help them advance in different ways and then you have um you know, some electricity powered by wind turbines and by water, like, you know, hydropower and things like that, that the Diamond Kingdoms have kind of worked together to share over the years. So there's all these different like elements at play. So you'll see things in the book where, um, you know, they have an elevator in the annex and they have, um, they have vehicles powered by these batter magic batteries, essentially. Um, 
but it's also not as prevalent as it would be in a world like ours. So like, and especially because they are a kingdom at war, they are rationing a lot of the magic right now in Anglon in particular. So, you know, you have a scene where they are in a car, um, but it's powered by this magical battery and Kara has this whole like thing of like, should we actually be using this? Because what if you, what if there's like a more important reason to be in the vehicle and we don't have enough power for it, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, they get to they get to use some interesting blends of technology and, um, and the world is kind of based around some of those things. And then you also see a lot of the old world heritage where Amblon city streets, for instance, aren't really made for vehicles. So like the interior, the oldest parts of the city, you can't drive a car down them. It's kind of like, um, in Venice, Italy, like they don't have cars, you know, like they're walking around everywhere. It's kind of like that has some of that old world heritage in there. Um, but you also have this road that'll circle the, the city and they transport, you know, exports to other kingdoms and things like that. What's your favorite fusion of technology and magic in this book? Do you have a favorite? Uh, there's, there's so many good ones. Um, there is one character who has a tattoo that's made out of a seared in ink, which is very rare. Um, he is a special little duckling that got it. Um, but I really liked that. That was really fun for me to write. And so it kind of works to amplify his power a little bit. Um, there's something that even didn't explicitly make it into the book, <laughs> but I really still love was there is, um, Ramsey was working on this, um, based on like a real science that I found of like renewable energy where the floors in what they call the commons, which is where in the annex um, they go to eat together. Um, the floor would have panels made from like the Assyrian wood and that would like form a renewable energy just by walking on it. And it was really fascinating to look into that and I couldn't fit it into the book like naturally you know like there was no reason for that to come up in conversation <laughs> i was like oh man like i really wanted because ramsey's very much an innovative kind of person he's always mm -hmm. he's so interested in all of that he's like what can what else can we do like how can we improve things make things better for everyone um and so like i was like oh poor ramsey his idea doesn't even get to go in the book um but things like that i just i don't know it's really fascinating to me i love trees <laughs> I just, oh wow I just do and like learning, getting to like explore that a little bit and see the different things um, that I could tie in with this magical forest that you don't typically get to see with, you know, an enchanted forest is usually just enchanted and, you know, special for that reason. Um, but, uh, but being able to- Not like, mine. <laughs> Oh, really? I have enchanted. Yo, yeah, I have yeah. most of my books to take place in an enchanted forest, and I yeah. keep finding new things in there. That's sentient, the forest. The, usual, the, the forest yeah, has yeah, is sentient, go. so it's yeah. not. It's but not usually, just full you know, of magic. Kind of traveling. A lot of times, they go into the forest versus they treat it like there's some. some they mentioned pilgrimages and things in there because it is sacred, um, but there's also like we're going to harvest from this and like use the magic to benefit us, um, which it's been fun for me to explore. So I don't know. I just, I really enjoy that. I really do like um, Kara's connection to the forest. And, and so she feels the magic a lot of times. And so she, I really like her door and like how she can just kind of feel it and like walk through the door, you know, um, not everyone feels it the same way she does. And so that was kind of fun for me to write too. just her, connection to it and like okay she can just touch this door and feel that flow of magic and also walk through the you know unlock it and walk through the door no that's very cool i don't let my characters do anything with the forest <laughs> <laughs> they can cross it at their own peril well, but I mean, you can't person, harvest yeah, it sounds a little more uh it's but it's sentient it's gonna fight you back if you try to take the like, wood so come at me like please try to harvest. Yeah. <laughs> the forest, ha there's three rules to survive, like going through the forest. Oh, no. One of them is you can't cut the trees down. <laughs> well, I mean, that's very fair. 
But, you know, trees are, you know, they grow, they drop branches. There's no rule that says you can't take anything that they drop. And anything that they drop would still have magic. So, like, there like, are loopholes here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is stuff that's made out of it. I love um, it. But you got to be sneaky. <laughs> I mean, that is the key. Yeah. On most fantasy endeavors, I feel like you have to feel. Yeah, a, a certain amount of sneakiness is necessary. <laughs> um, no, that's really cool. That that's too bad you couldn't get the floor in there. Like, is I there? Know. I'm like, is, maybe maybe later it can come into play somehow. But is this a series? It is. So, Smoke and Light is the first of a trilogy. Yeah. And you you didn't is is the trilogy finished? Are you still working on it? I'm just Both? wondering if you can get the, the floor in there in another book. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be something that can just naturally fit into the story, which is a bummer, but it's also okay because I can talk about it, you know? <laughs> like this, yeah. It exists. You just don't know that. Maybe you can find like a short story where like somebody like tries to steal the idea, the plans or something <laughs> for it. <laughs> I write solely a bonus scene just so Ramsey can explain the floor to people and be excited about it. Why not? Like it just so everyone knows this is our newest renewable energy uh, initiative here. And Well, if somebody tries to steal the plans or something or finds <laughs> out about it or tries to stop him from doing this, then you have a reason to write it. <laughs> and I mean, bonus, he has to explain it. Explain it, Ramsey. Tell us all about your innovative floor. No, it's. I don't think it'll fit, like, genuinely, which is a bummer, but it's okay, because so much of the world building, this is a very, like, character-driven, um, emotional um, kind of story. It's So he's not emotional enough about this floor? <laughs> No, it just said it doesn't it doesn't fit in. Like I tried. I looked at it a few different ways. I was like, there is no way <laughs> to really just like sneak this in here um in a way for it to make sense. So yeah, it's it's very much a the world building was layered in slowly. Um with every layer of editing I did, I was like, okay, what else can I layer in about the world? <laughs> without it getting to be too much because so much of the story um it's, it's i mean it's necessary for like you know solidifying yourself into the world so you understand the story but that's all the cool things about it are kind of uh, just cool things about it and not as big of a deal as some of the other things um going on and, and the relationships really are a huge part of the story so i had to kind of focus on that more than the floor mm -hmm. <laughs> understandable understandable so so we've got how magic and technology meet and marry what so the magic system it sounds like you said you had some elemental is there like an overarching system for the magic or um yes it's so much of this is interesting in in writing it especially because Kara doesn't remember so much so it's like she kind of has to ask some of these questions and like have it explained to her again you know um as things different things come up but the the overarching lore of it is that many many years ago there was these this man um who had power and he was basically the only one at first and so um he started gifting people with some of the magic um the where that all started tied back to the forest and so the the origin and the lore there is that the forest was the source of magic and it kind of spread and spread and then humans started developing some magic as well um so he would gift people and then those bloodlines from the people who had magic at that point then it would skip generations, sometimes several, and then someone would pop up with it. And so like the elemental magic and all of that kind of flows from those bloodlines. Um, so not everyone has it. Uh, not everyone in the same family has it. Like you might have it and then your great granddaughter might have it, you know, um, that sort of thing. And so they are held in high esteem, known as gifted. Um, they you typically try to use their gifts in a way that benefits the kingdom um in some way and that's not to say like they're all guards um some of them are you know market vendors but they use some of them are you know putting out fires with water magic stuff like that or fire magic you know controlling it 
Um, so different aspects like that, but it, it, it's kind of stemmed from there. You've got the, the forest element and you have the elemental magic element. And then those are, you know, through bloodlines. And then Kara was born in the sacred grove, which isn't typically allowed. It was because of her parents. Her father was um, one of the people in charge of caring for the forest. And so it kind of accidentally had her <laughs> in the forest. And um, yeah, so she has that connection to the magic and you get to learn more about that as she goes around along in the book. But yeah. That's pretty cool that she was born in the Enchanted Forest. Yes. Special. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm wondering like if that should if that's special in my world. <laughs> I've never thought about it. Right? Like, are there but any it, uh remedies like, for being born? It now? covers like the entire country. It's the entire country is Enchanted mm. Forest. So yeah. there's probably a lot of people born in it. So I'm not sure that like I'm not sure. Could be. Could be not. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> I don't have any characters currently that were born in it. They were born in like the city or the town yeah. that they live in. <laughs> right. <laughs> like we're you not know? going into the sentient forest. Too. Yeah, their mom was like, yeah, no. There I'd rather be here where child. there's a midwife <laughs> and like a comfortable place to to do the thing. <laughs> yes. I mean, your, your forest, uh, to be fair, sounds a lot angrier than mine. I mean, it can be. <laughs> But it could also be protective. Like, you're not allowed oh, yeah. to harm people in there. So if you're, like, a Aww. kid, like, you are very safe going in there. there you, go. <laughs> you know? Like just it. don't. Yeah. Like, there's. And there's the queen of all trees who's also around. She's a giant okay. tree. She's a giant tree. I love she it. Is. She's a giant sentient tree. Like, I love it. Well, with there magic. Is, um, in, in the Assyrian forest, there is the oldest tree. Um and we get to learn more about that in the other books. But yeah, I, I enjoy I enjoy a good old tree. Does your tree wander around though? Because mine does. No. She can walk. She can teleport. She can talk to people if she wants I love to. It so much. She can. She's the queen of their country. Technically, they deposed her, and she doesn't. But like, yeah, like she didn't really want to have anything to do with the passing of laws, anyway. So <laughs> she's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, but, like, I'd rather do my thing. Yeah, I'm, you know, I still have the hearts of the people. So, like, yeah. I don't really. She's a giant tree. Like, what's she going to do? Sit in the like, council hall and listen to people complain about things? That's really not her style. <laughs> like, this is not for me. Like, yeah, you guys she's... do whatever you want with that. I'm yeah. Keep yeah. you all in line out here. Exactly. It's like, I'm just going to go roam around and like see if anybody needs any help with anything. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, what else are you going to do? You know, put down roots and stay somewhere? No. <laughs> I don't want our trees to be friends now. She can have friends. Our forest friends. She has lots of friends. Um, she's one of my favorite characters, so she pops up like everywhere. I love it. I want to mean, she literally can. She, I know she does. <laughs> just like, boop, here I am. Yeah, oh, I, love I gotta it. put her. I gotta put her in the trilogy I'm writing now. She hasn't popped in there yet. They've been like all over the place. They've been outside the country, and she doesn't leave the country. So, well, I, I mean, to, that's fair. Yeah, I gotta figure that out. We're getting <laughs> towards the end of the trilogy here, and she hasn't popped in yet. Oh no, she's gotta make it in. Yeah, that'll be like the first book that she hasn't popped into somehow. We'll we'll figure it out. Like even if she just shows up at the end, like I think that would be fine. I love her. <laughs> yeah, she's I love her. Um anyway, we've gotten way off it's topic. Fine. <laughs> I, I told you I love trees. I love forests. Yeah. This is all too. fascinating to me. I love talking about them. Me too. So all right, so the so they're involved in the war, you said. Yes. Is it is it is it against one of the five cities or against somebody else or so, just against these rebels like is it yeah. in, into like a problem that is only in anwan because it sounded like the other city states were involved in this war so the the way that it is supposed to work is that the the diamond kingdoms are the five city kingdoms each city yeah. kingdom is its own like sovereign entity so yeah. they have a ruling family that is in charge of their area, but they kind of form a consul and they make decisions for the good of everyone. Um, when the war broke out, it, it really 
goes against everything that they stand for. It was very shocking. Um, and everyone else kind of just went, not our, like, not, no, no, this is not, this is not okay. Um, and they are kind of on their own right now. Um, and Lon is. So it's the rebels versus the ruling family of Anlon right now. Okay, um, nobody else is involved. No one is directly involved in the conflict. They're still like, imports are still coming in from, you know, one of the other kingdoms. And then the rebels are like, we'll take that. Thank you. You know, like that kind of stuff is going on. Um, it's, it's not, it's not quite a siege and it's not quite like messy, awful battles all the time. It's a little more because they want control of the kingdoms, but they still like, even the rebels are still like, we don't hate everyone here, you know, like they have family in the area and stuff. So it's a very messy, like civil war kind of situation where um, inside the city walls, it's fairly safe from the rebels. Um, and then outside of it, it's like the people don't really venture out there very much, but they're still getting that, you know, imports and things and they're still sending exports and stuff like that. So it's, it's a little bit like everyone's kind of tiptoeing <laughs> to try to keep, uh, things going the way they need to, but at the same time, you know, people aren't really traveling to Anlon, they're not doing their pilgrimages to the forest. Um, that kind of stuff is, has stopped, and they're kind of waiting for the like the call to arms essentially. The others of like, are they going to help or are they not? Um, I see, yeah, they're, they're in a they're in a bit of a pickle, and everyone's kind of shocked and also dealing with their own stuff too um to where so some would be more interested in helping than others right now so i would put that and you see a little bit of that in the book um when they're talking at one point about something and uh emila refers to one of the uh essentially the king of one of the other ones as grumpy um because he wants nothing to do with them right now until they I fix see. their mess um kind of a thing I see. That would be yeah. a messy thing to get involved in. Yeah. Um, and you, you said it's a trilogy. It is. Is, yeah. is the trilogy Kara and Ramses in each book, or are you is in, and we're just in Anne one? No. <laughs> so um, the the interesting thing with all of this for me was that uh, Smoke and Light, which is right here. Um, this is book one, and it's very much more of an isolated setting because you okay. are you're in Kara's point of view and Kara has a very you know protected life at the at the moment and it starts expanding a little more as she starts getting better and making her own life decisions for better or for worse um and then when you get into you hear about people from the other kingdoms a little bit in the first book. You hear about rebels, you see some rebels, and mm -hmm. like it, it expands the farther we go into the trilogy. And so you see more of uh, the other diamond kingdoms and um, the ruling, like you meet some of the ruling family and in book two of other places. Trying to say things without saying too much. It's like okay, is that is that because Kara goes there or that is it different points of view um it stays in Kara's point of view um but that doesn't necessarily mean that Kara is the one in all the other places they all can travel people can do whatever they want no, I, see. I see yeah <laughs> it's, um, yeah it's one of those things where um I think once you get to the end of book one you're kind of like okay it makes sense that this world, like she's going to start seeing more, um, you know, it makes sense that you might meet more people than, than you do in the first book. Yeah. Um, as the story continues, but yeah, you don't, you don't get to like explore everywhere. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. Like you, you get to like meet more people <laughs> from other Right, places. right. But, so yeah, other, as far as point of view. Right. So the other diamond um, kingdoms, they can, mm -hmm. If they can easily get to Anwan if they want to. More or less, yeah. Um, I mean, the for, barring is, the leaving the rebels aside, it's, if the rebels right, weren't yeah, there, it's, like it's, there's it's not like awesome. mountains and and no, oceans no. and things in between no. them. No, and they have um, 
you know, they have roads set up to connect them. They're not actually that far apart in, like if you're looking at a, like a Google Maps, <laughs> you know, and you're like, let's go from this kingdom to this kingdom. It, it wouldn't be that far of a distance to travel really. And so it is very doable for them to all go wherever they want to go and they do. And that's part of the console. Like they would meet regularly. Um, as so if you left Add one at like eight in the morning, like <laughs> could you get to like one of the other diamond cities by like eight in the evening or is it like a multi-day like walk? Um, oh, uh, oh, for a walk. Yeah. It would take you a few days. Um, okay, but if you which had really like fun to like sit and plot out, I actually pulled up like Google Maps and I was like, okay, so if this was in my area and I needed them to walk from like here to this place, then it would be about this much of a walk. <laughs> I did, I sat and did all that, um, which was quite the adventure. Yeah, no, I mean I've had to do that too, so <laughs> I I feel that. Visceral. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had to do walking, that. It would take this long, and so they need this many days to get somewhere, and then these people from over here would be this many days. And they'd have to camp along the way. Yeah, I mean, they do, you know, they do have some transportation, so, like, they, but not everyone has access to it. So, like, the ruling families, like, they could probably make it pretty quickly. Um but yeah, the the war is re like really throws a wrench in things for people because they don't have access to all the things as readily um, as they would have before. So you know, Anlon's rationing their stuff, um, and some of the other Diamond Kingdoms have to ration the things that they would have gotten from Anlon. Yeah. So it kind of throws everybody into a bit of a pickle while they're trying to figure things out. But they're all staying away because of the the threat travel there right now anyway so right right so you said it's a trilogy and uh, it's kind of out and it's kind of not out no no oh sorry it, it's it's <laughs> kind of written um oh okay it's not out yet. so oh Night okay it came out on march 5th so the first book came out march 5th um the entire trilogy i have written the first drafts of i'm editing book two um right now and then we'll go into book three after. So they're not out yet, but they are written. So I guess is, is book two, do you think it'll be out by the end of this year or? No. no okay. So <laughs> next year. No, we're I don't. At, well, so the thing, with it is, the thing with it is, is that. Um, I, no, it takes time. <laughs> it does, no. And I, I have been dealing with some health issues that have been pretty intense. So my original timeline got disrupted in oh, no. to where I don't know anything right now, um, which is fine. But also I published um, Smoke and Light. I, I did a Kickstarter campaign for it. And okay. I would like to do a Kickstarter again for book two, but part of my um, Kickstarter process is early access. So to set a release date for book two, I have to know when I'm at a point where I could do a Kickstarter campaign and then give a certain amount of months before I do like the retail release and all of that. So it's, um, I'm just not in a position where I can set the dates right now. So right. I'm kind of uh, just starting to edit again after all the craziness of the last like six and a half months. And so, um, yeah, I don't know exactly when, but I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I would love for it to be finished by the end of this year. <laughs> that would be cool, but I, I totally understand that not being able to pin a date on something is I'm yeah. going to do a Kickstarter for my next release and Yay. trying to pin that down has been hard because it's a whole trilogy that will be releasing at once because yeah. I don't know how else to torture myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's all kinds of ways you can do it, which is the great thing about the platform, you know, like you can do all sorts of stuff with it. Yeah, but it's trying to creep out and be like become a four book trilogy, oh, no. <laughs> which is not a thing. <laughs> They're like, we just want to be a quartet now, please. Yeah, the character's four like, how about book four? And I was like, no, this is a trilogy. <laughs> you have to end it. You have to end it in in book three. That's that's it. You can go on and do stuff in other books. So I write right. connected series. Yeah. So like, you can show up in another book, another series, because <laughs> like they all take place in. 
well, they all take place in the same world and, and, and within, you know, around the same time as each other. Like, you can all come back now. <laughs> Most of the people in this one, this one are immortal anyway. So, like, they were, oh, they're definitely go. around. Yeah. Like, but, like, life left in them. Yeah. So, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's hard to pin down some kind of thing because I have to finish writing it and then edit it. And then you have to, you know, get all the proofs. And like you know, put together the campaign. Then you have to run it, right? And all that, yeah. <laughs> and then you have to fulfill <laughs> it. And then you can figure out, okay, when is this monster going on retail? Right. Yeah. Um, and and I'm pretty. I I love planning. Um, I'm a yeah. big planner kind of person. So like all of that is fun for me. Normally, <laughs> I get excited by it. It's just the the unreliability on the health side. It's like just I'm like I cannot i cannot pick a date and think that i will have the ability to like stick to it so i just i'm gonna just wait just edit we'll work on the things and then once things start happening and i mm -hmm. know then we can we can figure that out but you know with the books being drafted already it makes it easier to just be like it is coming soon i just cannot tell you when soon it is yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So give me a little time, and then I'll I'll come back around to that. But yeah, because mine is I'm still I'm at halfway through book three, so like I'm like yeah soon. But I don't know exactly when because right. I have to finish writing it, and then it has to be edited and formatted, right. and I need to get the proofs to make sure they look okay. Right. You know, yeah. there's a lot that goes into it. So yeah, and that's all time. Yeah, and it's hard to, and you have the health thing. I have a day job, so, like, it's, yeah. I don't, I'm doing this in between all of that. So, it's, like, it's, it makes it, like, very, I am a planner or project manager by trade. Oh, and yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's my day job. But, like, <laughs> it's, it's frustrating being an author and, and also working as a project manager, like, trying to plan my own stuff when I don't have control over my schedule because I have the full-time job. I commute to the office three days a week. And when there's holidays and things, it throws that off. I do the podcast. I've got a newsletter, like all these things have to be done. And like you still, and I need to write at least four chapters a week and trying to figure out like not knowing, well, how many chapters book can have? Right. Are the characters going to stick to any of the plot points that I've come up <laughs> with for them? Like there's so many like unknowns, like trying to put together a plan that isn't so detailed that I can't stick to it. Yeah. but is loose enough that like it doesn't have like a solid you have to hit this sort of date because you know because there's all these things we can't control i have family you know yeah. my dad was in the hospital a few months ago <laughs> like that was not something that i could have planned for you know yeah. so like yeah no it, it's really i don't i don't know that like anybody outside of an author like knows like how hard it is to like pin down that date until you're like very close to the end then you can be like okay even if the world explodes like i'm <laughs> there, like there's very few things that could knock me off this date you know yeah but getting to that is such a journey it is Every, yeah it's, journey is a good it's an word. epic <laughs> quest you know it and is. we're doing it without magic <laughs> you, you know where is my spirit and magic right help me Where's my unicorn or my dragon, you know, or, or my pot of gold or you were doing all of this like on a hope and a prayer and in our spare time. <laughs> it's no, good, and I, it is it is a worthwhile journey. It it's is that. Yeah, there are some aspects of, of that that are harder to kneel down. Um, and I think like to a certain degree. I, like last year, I was able to keep up with things where I still did the Kickstarter, but I got yeah. this right as my Kickstarter was launching and had like a six, well, six and a half month span like now of, of just like so many things that you can't, you just can't plan for. And it was so wonderful. Like everyone in that backed by Kickstarter was very kind as I was like, you know, rolling through things and, you know, had a couple things that maybe were later than I anticipated, but still kind of on track because I had put buffer in, but not like six months of buffer. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like hard. rolling through things. So it's, it's really nice that like so many readers are really uh, supportive 
and willing to just be there with you, you know, like, like yeah. we, we, we are excited about this project. We are excited about this book. Like, yes, we want it, but also it's okay. You know? Um, so that was really helpful for me, but that's why I'm kind of taking a step back with it and being like, yeah, I, I will tell you a date for book two as soon as I know a more reliable date for book two. Yeah. Because otherwise you can, like, I've seen, I've been self-publishing since 2016. I've seen so many authors, like, put out these, like, these dates and then they kill themselves practically to make it. And it's like, well, that's, you know, that's not good. Because no. <laughs> you can't keep, you know, how long can you do that before, like, your health suffers in, in a catastrophic way? Right. And the sustainability as an author is really important to me. Like, mm -hmm. even, even before I was you know, coming into publishing and for some, for some things in my life, like it has to be a priority, but at the same time, it is something that like truly matters to me. And I'm very much like, let's be gentle. Like, let's yes. <laughs> let's myself and like, let's, you know, slow is okay. Slow, you know, relatively speaking for what, you know, what is slow, what is fast. It, it all depends on the person. Right. Um, but just like giving myself permission to do that stuff. Yeah. It very easily can become, too much and i know burnout um is terrible and i don't want to deal with it you know any if i don't have to and setting setting those slower paces for myself and giving myself that space to just say like okay this is the date for this is going to come later or no, i'm going to work on this as i can um you know as as i'm able to with what's going on in my life what's my capacity right now and just letting things flow a little bit more um from that of okay am i am i being like giving myself the space that i need do i have the capacity to do this thing and if not then like what needs to change um going slower pulling back pausing for a little bit coming back to it you know later or um giving myself a little bit of a push but not a detrimental push you know there is a there's a line there and i think that line is hard for us sometimes to see but yeah. i've had a lot of practice so I'm getting better at, at figuring that out for myself, you know, um, that self-awareness of like, okay, right now, this is what I can do. But even for me, having a lot of practice at it, sometimes it's really hard to find that line still. So yeah, it can be a lot. No, it definitely can. And, and slow is sometimes slow is fast. Cause if that's right. <laughs> the best you can do and that's the pace that you can maintain without burning out, then, then that, is the fastest you should be going because like yeah burnout is not good there's I, i've not been burned out on this on other things yeah but not on an author thing um and like and we i if we choose to write fantasy books for fun to bring that magic into the world that our lives lack yeah so and and that and like i never lose i tried to never lose sight of that like no other goal is as important than telling the best story I can, the most fantastical story I can, um, you know, with, with whatever the characters let me have in this book. <laughs> sometimes not all books are very like, are super high fantasy because you know, sometimes the characters don't let you go there. <laughs> sometimes they do. And, and, and right. we go. <laughs> yes. And it's, and that was one of the things with writing smoke and light was that, um, I try. I originally had the idea for this story like over 10 years ago and I tried to write it a couple different times and it just, it never worked. Like there was always something wrong. Yeah. Uh, like character names didn't even work like the first time I tried to write it. And in the world was one of those things that kind of came in and I was like, this is what it needs to be. It needs to be this blend of like the old world heritage and the modern flair and it needs to have these elements in it for the story to to work the way that it needs to. And um, I'm more of a theme writer, so it was really like when I knew Kara's character arc, I thought it was one book, it turned out to be three, and then it was like, this is character uh, Kara's character arc for book one, book two, book three. And then from that point on, I was like, oh, okay. And then the world kind of started forming out of that. And I was like, yes, this makes so much, so much more sense now. Like I can write this now, uh, which yeah, is really you, exciting. Yeah, because you knew her journey. Yeah. And it's like, this is what the story needs is this kind of world. And yeah. I would have guessed that. I tried to write it a little bit more of like, um, I think originally tried it as more of that traditional kind of epic fantasy 
space. And that's not the world that it's not the world. <laughs> right, so right. Now, you know, it, it makes so much more sense. And I like look at this book and I'm like, yes, this is what it this is what it needed to be the whole time. And now it is. And it's really exciting to like see it come together and like be a thing. Yeah, because you're you're seeing it through the character's eyes and seeing like what does this character what does the world need to be to bring out this character's journey so she can yeah. do what she needs to do to take us on this journey. Yeah, it makes total sense. And it's like, yes, there's a, a magical forest. And yes, there is a battery powered car in the same world. I mean, why not? Home. You know, it just it's just how this world is. And I why love not? it. It makes me happy. Why not? Mm -hmm. Why is it, and then you said so you've got the whole trilogy written. Is there anything that you're uh writing now? Are you planning to come to write more books in this world? Yeah, so uh it is very solidly like this story is a trilogy. Um, but I have kind of a an idea for um a story that kind of explains a little bit more of the war's beginning. Um, from a different character's point of view, and that would be more of a novella, I think. Um, I have no idea when I will write it, but that's kind of in the back of my brain. And then I've got um, potentially like a spinoff series of some kind with some other characters in this world that have started kind of chatting in my brain. And I'm like, please keep that spinning but also not yet um so yeah I'm yeah to see i would love to to do that um but i also have this other series that i'm really excited about and it's like a four book thing right now it might be five i'm not sure yet um mm -hmm. that i want to like get to so i don't know we'll see um right now i'm really just in i can only do one thing at a time yeah I don't even know it's not even like i can do one thing at a time every day so i'm like in that space of Ash and Light, which is book two in the series, editing that is the priority right now. And so that's what I'm like actively working on. Um, like as of this month, I'm just starting to get back into it. So that's exciting. And also um, one of those things where I am actually drafting some new scenes for it as I'm editing. So I'm getting a little bit of actual like new writing in while I'm editing. So that's kind of fun. That's great. Yeah. But no, you're you're totally right. Like you have to work on the book that's in front of you and like the one that is the most done. It's usually the next book. <laughs> right. And these these books, like I, I drafted Smoke and Light in November 2019 and finished it January 15th, 2020. And then I wrote book two in November 2020 and book three in November 2021. And so it's like these books have been sitting with me for a while. <laughs> and I came back to Spoken Light in like 2022 and, you know, started editing and all of that. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things where I'm like, I, I know that I need to focus on this trilogy and like continue working on that. And then, you know, the other stuff will come um, when it does. And I'm excited about the other things, but I am also very excited to be like in this world with Kara and her people and just exploring more of that and getting to like make book two just the most polished wonderful version of itself it can be because i really love this book oh wow no that it's your book baby so you need to yeah. do you need to do what's right for it yeah and it's it's been fun because there were some things you know i wrote the whole trilogy before i started editing book one and so, which I did on purpose because I wanted to write the whole story and then come back and like make it. And I'm an outliner and I pretty much stick to what I outline. So, but I mean, there's some surprises along the way, but I, I'm very much like, I, I outline, I know what I'm writing and then I just go. Um, so not too much changed overall, um, but I'm still finding like, oh, I know that I'm going to need to add stuff between these two chapters here <laughs> yeah. for it to like fully be what it needs to be. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now is working on those things and layering that in. And then I get to, you know, finish the other notes that I made when I was reading through it. So I admire that you can write the outline and stick to it. I am <laughs> not able to do that. <laughs> that's just how my brain works, I think. And that's, that's one of the things that I really, I don't know. I appreciate it about myself, I guess. Um, I 
have worked with a bunch of creatives over the years of like other capacities. And I know that like the way that my brain operates is not necessarily the standard creative experience. <laughs> Um, but I really, you know, it works for me. And that's what I think is important, right? Like figuring mm -hmm. out how do you work and what works best for you. And for me, like when I have an outline, I am like, good to go. That's when I sit and like, take all those conversations, the characters I've had that I've kept in notes on my phone, and I pull those out. And I make like, I think the book outline for smoke and light was like 19 pages long. Wow. <laughs> take that and then I write and it just, it works for me. No, that's so cool. I that's so cool. <laughs> I, I do some outlining, but then I have a hard time. Like I I don't like knowing what's gonna happen until I get there. And like, but yeah, you have to outline the ends of books because you have mm -hmm. to make sure you tie up all the things. And like that's when I start to lose all interest in the book because I okay. I like writing it when I don't know what's going to happen, when I don't know where we're going to go or how we're going to get to it. But when I have to sit down and figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? Like, I have no desire to write it. It's like, I already know this. Like, That's I don't it. Fun anymore. That's it. It's not, there's no, the mystery is gone. The adventure is over. The quest has been solved. And the, I, you know, the book is sitting there like, you, you still have to write this though. Yeah. Like, yeah, like I don't have a problem with this one because there's two things that I just can't figure out that I need to solve before the end, and I just I have can't. I've <laughs> plotted out uh, in in big stroke in big strokes, not like every little detail because that would drive me nuts. But just like in broad strokes, what does this character need to do in like one sentence or less in these chapters yeah. to get to the point that I know I need all the characters because they're all scattered all over the darn place. I need to get them back. <laughs> For the big ass showdown. <laughs> Come on, guys. Like, yeah, but there's dinner. two yeah. important things that have to be solved that have not been solved yet. And I'm like, still have no idea. So that mystery, those two mysteries are keeping me going, even though I know where all the other people are going to end up and I don't have any desire to write that stuff. That but good. I will keep those, power those through. little nuggets of mystery alive. Yeah, going. it's hard because like my, my favorite character doesn't have they're not a point of view character in here. So like mm -hmm. that's why I write so many. That's why I write so many books with the same with like the same main character. <laughs> because I like them. And even if I know what they're going to do, like it's more palatable if I have to write it from their perspective. <laughs> yeah, but they don't have they're not a POV character. Aww. Sad. That is sad. I, I'm like a. I'm weird. <laughs> I struggle with uh, multiple point of views, like as a reader, a lot of times. And so even when I when I'm writing, I'm like, mm, I, I like a single point of view. And then I uh, wrote like an epilogue of sorts. It's called The Aftermath, um, part one. And so that's at the end of Smoke and Light. And it's from a different character's point of view. And then I was like, oh, no. Yeah, I've done this, and now I must include something from this other person's point of view in book two as well. Um, so that's one of the one of the edits that I get to do is like adding a few of those in um, where they belong because I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, I need to happen with this, but yeah, I'm much more of like a and and I will read multi point of view and dual point of view and all of that. But I always have this moment where like I'll be reading a book and I'm attached to the main character, I'm in their point of view, whatever, and then it switches to someone else's, and I'm always like, ah, oh. like, I don't yeah. want to leave the other person. I get attached. That's my problem. I get attached. No, I can see that. I like multi point of view because then like the cat, you, the reader, some no more than the main character. Yes. Cause you know, like it's fun. Like, it's, like I have characters that like they're, they're they're plotting things, but like they're trying to be helpful. And they're like, well, the main character is dealing with all of this stuff. And we can yeah. take care of this other thing, and they don't need to know about it. Right? And then it always blows up somehow <laughs> in different <laughs> ways. And they're like, why didn't you tell me? About it anyway, and they're like, yeah. Hey. And like we were trying to, you know, we were trying to help. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or or you know, and like it's. I, I so I I like multi point of view for that reason because yeah, you can have like 
characters conspiring for good reasons, not anything bad. And I think that's fun for the reader, knowing that you can see how this could all go wrong and the characters can't, and you're just waiting. For it to, you're just waiting for it to blow up because you know, and you're like, you know, this is not going to work. That they're going to they're going to screw something up. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that, that is fun. And that's really what I think is like, what does the story need, you know, to be the best story it can be? And like, Smoke and Light was definitely like, no, this is a car point of view story. Like, right, right. It is. And most, almost all of the trilogy is completely from her point of view. There's just, I'm calling them interludes, <laughs> where you get like a little glimpse into someone else's point of view, um, which is, is important. No, it is. I it could, is. I could get away with it without it, I think, but like also not. <laughs> Sometimes you need it because they're seeing something that the character doesn't know about. Yes. Um, or and can't know about because of their station, situation, location, whatever. Right. right. Like and it's like if they're not there, they're not there. That's it. But sometimes you need that to know <laughs> to show. Needs to be there sometimes. That's it. Yeah, because this thing is coming or affecting them in a way, and the characters seeing the results, and it doesn't. It may not. There's a lot of situations where them seeing the results doesn't make any sense right. unless you know what's causing it. Yeah. Totally yeah. understand that. Yeah. It's it's fun. I I love it. I love the just figuring out what kind of story it needs to be you know what how does the story need to be told because i i know with this series in particular with the trilogy like i know the story and it, it for me it feels like the story is the story it doesn't feel mm -hmm. like i'm making all these decisions and like i am but you know it's like no this is that i'm like no 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 that's not that's not the story you know this is the story um and then seeing how it comes together from that space is, is a lot of fun. And I like seeing that in other books too. Like, oh yeah, like this is obviously the way the story needed to be told, you know, um, whether it's the multi POV versus single or a dual or whatever it is, um, even the tense and all of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really cool just to see how different people tell a story. No, it yeah. definitely is. That's why I have, have 3000 audio <laughs> <laughs> and God knows how many ebooks. It's fine. Just it's listen. fine. I don't have a. I don't have a problem. It's fine. I can quit anytime. But why would you want to? I don't. I love books, whether they're mine or someone else's. I love them all. Great. I, you know, there are worse things you could love than a book. Right. Right. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's definitely a good habit. <laughs> yes. Good for your brain. It's good definitely. for your creation. And it and teaches stuff. you yes. how to write books. Like it does, um, yeah. there's all different structures too. And it's like that's interesting. And like some genres use a certain structure more than others. Um I like in fantasy, they're like the MacGuffin, which is almost like if you to and and like a good MacGuffin story is almost like a football game. <laughs> the MacGuffin, you have to keep it moving down the field, like through the book, <laughs> in the oh. same way that like the football team is moving the ball across the field. You know, different yeah. different players may have it, but the MacGuffin has to keep moving with the story, <laughs> and the story <laughs> is following the MacGuffin. <laughs> down yeah, the yeah. And, it, and if you read enough books, you start to see that that is the structure. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much like a football game, whether you're picturing American football or the, the football um, that other people enjoy that we call soccer in the U.S. Same thing. <laughs> right. And <laughs> one of my favorites. Like, uh, the different, yeah, you just have different things that you learn. And I think even reading in different formats, like when mm -hmm. I... I've read a lot of audiobooks. I say read, I, whatever. Ah, I, I read a lot the of same, audiobooks. Same. I listen to them. Um, and they're just great for accessibility. And like, if I'm not feeling well, I'll just pop one on and like someone can read me a story. That's fantastic. But I realized when I was editing Smoke and Light and on, I was doing like an audio proofread and I was reading myself the story and I was picking up some of the narration habits of the audiobooks I couldn't listen yes. to. Yes. And I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. 
like I'm doing different voices and like I'm changing my tone and my pitch and like, you know, doing all these different things that I wouldn't have if I hadn't been listening to audiobooks so much at the time. Um, so I don't know. It's just fun to see like what you pick up and how things flow audibly versus, you know, if you're reading the prose versus hearing it and those differences. And I think they're all important, but yes, it's, it's fun to see like, oh, I listened to this book. And now I'm hearing it's my own writing. Like if I'm reading it out loud, I hear how it's different, you know, like maybe it needs to flow a little better. Yes. Or, or maybe I need to have a different, um, like not a dialogue tag. Maybe I need to do an action beat or whatever it is, or maybe I need to take that out all together to just be the dialogue, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah. I forget that you can use that dialogue tags. I like, I almost always use action beats. My characters are always moving around doing things. Oh, let us, let us <laughs> they do, do not stay, but it's like, it's true to them. You know, like they're yeah. not like, they're not going to sit around. They're just, they're just characters who aren't going to sit around and do something. So they're like, you know, roaming around, th living in the space that they occupy, not yes. over, pushing people <laughs> like they're interacting with their space and with other people. Like, yeah. you know, maybe they, you know, I had one scene where they're like, they were talking and like the one, the ones just hit the other one with a pillow. <laughs> and so they're still talking, but they're hitting each other with it. pillows. <laughs> like, this is normal for us. <laughs> they're siblings and this, they're in the middle of this like it. magical ridiculousness and they just decide that they're going to, um, but while well, this magic ridiculous is going on, they're just going to smack each other with pillows. <laughs> you know, are these are these characters immortal characters? By the way, you said most of them are. Um, his sister smackers. is. She was a ghost who became an angel, and then she became the angel of death, and he doesn't know about it. Wow. But he's fully mortal. But he's a wow. mage, and they're long lived. So, hey. um, I was, yeah. I don't know. It just kind of in my head, I was like, I feel like this is even funnier if it's an immortal person, just like. Oh no, people. I have. <laughs> My, my one of my favorite immortal characters has lots of children because like she's been up she's like t older than dirt she's like 10 10 or twelve thousand years old and oh, you know yeah it doesn't you know if you live that long you know you can start your life over many 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 times you can have many yeah. many children in that time and have many 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 centuries where you don't have any children but you're not giving birth to anybody you know yeah. you, you can space things out quite well with that um <laughs> And, you know, whenever you feel like doing the family thing, you do it. And, like, um, so she's uh, she's the ex-goddess of fate and the future. So she can see the future, visit the future, play with the timelines in the future. Like, anything that has to do with the future. And she also has fire magic. And so all of her kids have fire magic. And um, they're all demigods, all her kids. Um, actually, there are a few that are not demigods, but... I don't know if they're still alive. I haven't seen them in a long time. I don't know if they're still roaming around. They haven't checked in recently. <laughs> um, but all the ones that we that have popped into the books are all demigods. And um, one of and they can, you know, they have various different powers. And um, like there's no pillow fights with them, but like one of them like goes to the future and brings back things, clothes, usually clothing that's inappropriate to this place and time. Oh, <laughs> and man. she's like what are you wearing? And, and like, did you bring that back in the future? You're not supposed to do that. Like you could, you change the whole, whatever this fabric doesn't belong here. They don't have these material, like this whole, like they have a whole argument about his clothes and, or, or she's like relieved that he's wearing something appropriate to this place in time. And it's not wearing some, some thing he brought back from another timeline. Cause yes. he likes to bring back tro like things from timelines that cease to exist. <laughs> you know, like, of like thinking yeah. that, I, I don't know, just the thrill of it. Um, yeah. But it seems, usually seems like as it's collapsing, he's like, Oh, let's grab a souvenir and get out of here. <laughs> um, Love yeah. They so every time like, uh, fun people to hang out with. Yeah, no, they're a lot of fun. They just, I just wrote a scene with them and he was wearing, uh, I decided to be cheeky in this scene. And I was like, <laughs> I was thinking of putting like a t-shirt in the Kickstarter. I have not figured out how to handle that yet. That says like I went to the Library of Forbidden Knowledge in Hell, and all I got was this shirt and a book. Because <laughs> the Kickstarter is going to be for the trilogy, the Rogue Gods trilogy, <laughs> and there is a Library of Forbidden Knowledge, and it, somebody goes to it in every single book for some reason. <laughs> There's well, some reason it, that they have to go spend some time at the library and deal with its mind-bending logic. Um, 
So um, I had him wear it, and his mother was like, where did you get that? And, what, and it's something he brought back from the future, from the, the launch of some books. <laughs> I love it. That's yeah. so fun. Yeah, I was like, you know what? They do product placements in movies and in contemporary books. Like, why can't I put my own product in there? I have another book series oh, where, wow. like, the the characters, like, are reading, like, a copy of the first book of the series. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, so I, it's a running gag. I love it. I was like, why not? It's epic fantasy, but I make the rules. So, fun. you know, like you, I like things to be hopeful. I like things to be lighter. And like, I like to poke fun at things. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I will take you on an emotional journey, but like, I'm not going to leave you in the, in the horribleness of it. You know, yeah. like, there's a hopeful undertone and then there's always a hopeful ending with me. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to poke fun at like something in my world <laughs> just it. for fun. Like, yeah. Why Before not? you can poke fun at it, I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> the characters will poke fun at it for you. This is not going to be one of those epic fantasy books where, like, they see the weird thing and and don't comment on it. <laughs> no, they're gonna. They are going to to uh, ask questions, complain about it, joke about it, like. And I feel like, especially if so many of your characters are like live a long time, like yes, they absolutely should yeah say those kind of things yeah and, and some of them have been around since before these things existed exactly. <laughs> they, they've seen them get constructed and they still don't know why it, they saw it happen and they still don't know why anybody would choose to do that right with their time <laughs> You're like, yeah no this doesn't work for me yeah that the, the one of the biggest running gags is like why would anybody enchant like that many miles of forest and then make it sentient like why would you do that there's no answer to this no one knows why <laughs> there's many yeah. theories but no one knows why I love um, it. Yeah. yeah and that's the thing like not everything gets explained you know yeah and like it shouldn't be honestly like not everything should be explained and I love that you have that <laughs> oh yeah I mean play with it your characters are just like why though yeah, I mean, someday I might, I might explain it. There might be some character who puts forth like a reason. I'm like, yeah, you know, that might be it. Let's do a book yeah, on that. Exactly. Since I write all the books in the same world, and I've, I've written 26 books in the world so far. Wow. I've published 24 of them. Well, 26 books and a half because I'm writing the 27th now. <laughs> I love it. That's impressive. Good for you. That's that's all I do. Like I come home from work and I just work on these things of my whole life. <laughs> I love it. I love that there's so many books in the same world and that you have so many like shared characters. Yeah. So I'm a character person. So like I just if I get attached to a character, I I just want to spend time with them. I'm oh like, yeah. Come back. come back in another book. Come back. Oh they do. Oh they do. Oh, I do. Them. I love that too. I love like finding like like reasons story reasons that they should pop in for a visit yeah um, i think that's, that's one of the things that the spinoff um that's kind of starting to form in in my brain like i my characters from smoke and light like they are the ones that have had like a full-blown like scene already yeah like here we are <laughs> and this is why we matter to this story and i'm like oh okay um if, like everybody else needs to like have their say as well if this is going yeah. to become a thing but like it's fun it's fun to see you know outside of the original story you had in mind yes. for them, like what they would be doing and how that could play into like a larger story or someone else's story it's fun I just like no it, it is uh, it, it is fun to see them again in a different context where the world isn't ending and they're not responsible. They can sit on the sidelines and have popcorn and joke about it. You know, <laughs> like it's fun to see them in a different context. Yeah. Or they might decide these people don't know what they're doing. We need to get involved and like help them. <laughs> I guess. And help. <laughs> accidentally create more problems. Because <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Because we're not going to tell them that we're getting involved because we don't want them to know that we think they're doing a bad job. <laughs> oh, I love it. In my That's case, uh, then some of the 
characters that would be have the spinoff are a little younger than uh, the characters that are the main characters of this one. So it's like mm, they might need a little assistance. Yeah, that's always fun. That, that's always fun, and and it's fun to see like the younger characters because one of the uh, there's a uh, one of the, my favorite characters is a single parent. He has a little boy. Oh. And like the little boy is like, we get his point of view, and he has definite opinions on what is going on, and he does he thinks adults are weird. Because <laughs> magic is illegal in his country, and he's like, magic is cool. It does awesome things. It's amazing. It's, his dad is an earth mage, so he's usually mm -hmm. using his magic to shield him, <laughs> to shield Junior, who wants to run in and fight monsters. <laughs> But he's four, so he can't do that Aww. yet. And like, so to his mind, like magic is cool. It glows. It's pretty. It's it protects me. It's doing yeah. all this cool, neat stuff. It's showy, you know. Like magic is cool, and everybody who thinks it is not is weird. <laughs> yes. Like, what is your problem with this? Yeah, it glows, right? And then from other people's point of view, they're like, because he's like not afraid of anything. They're like. Okay, you are weird. <laughs> you think magic is cool. It is terrifying, <laughs> you know. Um, so it, yeah, it's fun having the different perspectives. The older ones more meshed in like the world and their um, prejudices um, yeah. against magic, and you know this young person who has does not share any totally of that. different perspectives. I love totally that. doesn't get it. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that about characters, but like getting to explore, you know, what they see and what they've experienced and letting that shape their view of the situation and other characters in the world and all of it. It's yeah. Yeah. Especially when they have a lot of life experience and like what they're seeing, like just doesn't jive with it. Like, I think those are fun characters to write too. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily immortals, like, like no, yeah. people who have a lot of people who are not teenagers. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I'm a <laughs> lot of my uh, characters are young folk because I write YA fantasy. So like Car is 19 at the start of Smoke and Light. Um, and then a couple people like I kind of am in the YA slash in a uh, shelved YA, but can kind of cross over to the new adult um, stage based on age, not content wise. Like it's it's pretty chill. Uh, but uh, yeah, like you've, you've got like some of the older characters and they're just like, so done, you know? With yeah. Somebody. I've got one in particular. I'm like, yeah, they get grumpy. They don't say a whole lot, but like you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. They might not say it to your face, but you're just like decision, bad decision. But some of those grumpy characters are really fun to write about. I have a couple of those that are oh, like, just are. really fun. Like, especially how they express their grumpiness <laughs> and like what things make them grumpy and like what things, you know, where is the threshold between, oh God, I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> You're just right. useless. <laughs> like, why am I not in charge of this? And you are. Right? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't have magic. Sorry to break it to you, dude. <laughs> but this has been awesome. Is there anything else you want to say about smoke and light? Oh, um, well, it's it's a lot of fun for me. Like, I love this book so much. Um, it's, it's one of those things where I get very, very excited about sharing this book. And I'm just so thrilled that it's out there now after so long of just being the seed of an idea in my head. Um, but yeah, I, I totally I really get enjoy that. It. If you like young adult fantasy, if you like um, no spice romantic fantasy, if you like hopeful stories, um, but aren't afraid of the a little bit of like emotional stuff going on, um, then I think I think you'd like it. So if you want to check it out, you can find it um, pretty much on any retailer, your local library. You can request it there. Um, my website is kristenartistbooks.com. And if you go there, you can also find a full content guide if that is something that you would be interested in. It does contain spoilers. So like, watch out for that. There is a lot that can be spoiled in this book um, just because of the nature of it. But if that's okay with you, that's okay with me. So you can go to kristenartistbooks.com slash smoke and light and learn more about the book and find the content guide and um, read a little bit more about like the three main characters and stuff like that. So feel free to do that if you want. Um, I would love to have you. You can 
spend some time in the Diamond Kingdoms and uh, see for yourself <laughs> the magic and the science. And we'll have the links in the show notes or the description, depending on where you're watching or listening. So to worry about if you're like, wait, how do I spell oh, that? I spell? Just yeah. check the description of the show notes. It's in there. You can just click and go. <laughs> I know. It's so tough when you're trying to like audibly figure out, wait, how do I spell that? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So we've done the hard work for you. We we have the links in there. So don't yeah. struggle. Don't stress. Right. You know. False fails. Just start Googling all the different possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> I, so I don't know well you just google smoke and light it's true if you if you do that an artist is i don't know not super i don't I mean Kristen artist is not a super super complicated name i know there's different spellings for it but you know it's an i everybody K-R-I-S-T-I. well like they might be thinking is it is it chr is it kr it's kr yeah. <laughs> i mean i i know some Kristen's that are spelled like very differently. And yes, <laughs> I've seen Kristen spelled many, many different ways. With like it's... Y's and H's in there, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's all in the show notes or the description. Um, so you'll you can get the proper spelling or just click to yeah. go directly to these things. Yeah, it comes to high to work. Like I love saying hi to people. Come visit. Yeah, no, wait, we authors like when you come visit us. <laughs> When you come join us in our fantasy. I I, kind of call my online spaces like my cozy corners of the internet. Like, you can just come on in. I'll probably be drinking tea. I'll tell you more about Smoke and Light. (laughs) And all the other books that I'm reading. The audio books that I'm getting from the library. (laughs) It's just nice and cozy over here. So it's all good. We love that. We love a cozy story. Which is funny because, like, my book is not very cozy. I mean, I have, oh, I, I, I have some books it. that I've written some books that are cozy. So. I don't have I'm, that. I'm just a cozy person. Yeah, no, I've I write epic fantasy. I have written some cozy or epic fantasy stuff. Not it, I didn't realize that's what we were doing at the time. But like, because I write humorous, lighter, epic yeah. fantasy. It is still all the epic adventure and all of that. But we make jokes along the way. Yes, jokes are fun. You gotta add a little bit of levity. In yeah, there. and it's easy to humor. to slide from that into like a cozier story. Like especially if a yeah. character's like wounded and needs to recover and really can't go to the adventure, where the adventure has to come to them. Yeah, and you can do like fun, cozy stuff. I didn't even realize until I like wrote the whole thing, and I was like, oh, I just wrote a cozy fantasy book. <laughs> Aww. I had no idea that's what I was doing at the time. The characters came to me with this interesting idea, and I'm like, "Yeah, we should totally chase dragons. Let's go! <laughs> Why not? Let's do it." I feel like I need to read more cozy fantasy. Yeah, Maybe that'll be something for this year. But we weren't chasing them to kill them or anything. We wanted to make friends with them. Like that was Aww. that was. <laughs> um, like but the, that. the dragon didn't want to make friends, so <laughs> hence the chasing. <laughs> Oh, and, no. and the um, con- convincing the dragon that we have peaceful motives in mind. We just want to be friends. <laughs> but the dragon had two little babies to protect. So, like, she was not feeling, like, the trust. And it's a country where magic is illegal. So, yeah, like, yeah. you would be a little standoffish, too. Like, you- you'd True. be running away or flying. Well, she's wounded, so she can't fly away. So, so hence the chase. <laughs> I love it's just, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that one's not out yet, but it it, uh-huh. it, it is fun. It'll be out soon. <laughs> um, it, definitely this year, probably towards the end. Um, but yeah, because I have one more thing I have to write before it. So yeah. yeah, but it's fun. But yeah, no, cozy fantasy can be a lot of fun, and you can still you can do a lot of things with cozy fantasy in terms of like like adventure and stuff. As it, it's like, yeah. It's, you know, it's fun. I love it. So um, thank you so much. This has been another episode of Fantasy Lore and More. And today we had Kristen Artis and we were talking about Smoke and Light, which is her book. And, you know, make sure to like, subscribe, follow all the, you know, all the things so you get notified next time we have another fantasy author on where we, so we can, you can hear us talk about another fantasy book when I'll hopefully be a little more awake. <laughs> it's almost 10 o'clock and I'm fading. <laughs>
This was recorded on April 5th, 2024. So any time estimates given in here would be based off that date. So thank you so much. And definitely you know, come back with the next book whenever that is. Open invitation. So I would and, love to. This has been so fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, we, we love recurring guests. And yeah, and and so yeah, so make sure you you guys do all this all the things so that you and Kristen comes back to talk about <laughs> um you said Ash and Light. Yes. Then you'll that. hear all the goods. Oh yes. And all the spoilers. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I so. feel like I can't talk about book two without spoiling book one. It's fine. I mean, it, it's everybody has that problem, and it's so fun. It, it's fun for me as a host, and I've heard it's fun for listeners too to hear authors try very hard not to give away spoilers. They're like, wait, I came here, and they're like, wait a minute, I signed up for this voluntarily, and I don't want to give away certain spoilers, but I can't talk about this without get. It's fun to watch the mental gymnastics. Yes. <laughs> like, you signed up for this, I didn't twist your arm. Right. <laughs> it's fine. We figure it out as we go. It's already yeah, of course. Of course, love spoilers. I just I try not to, but at a certain point, I'm just gonna have to be like, and here we go. If you're sticking right, around, right, spoiler. I mean, occur. that's what the first book is for. It's the spoiler. But now that but you're editing book two, so you can add in stuff that you can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> this is the non-spoiler thing. <laughs> I mean, you have a unique opportunity to do that. <laughs> And we will now, never know unless you tell us if you did that. Now when I go back to read it, I'm going to be like, and now. <laughs> because of this conversation with Melinda, I'm going to be looking at this in a totally different way. <laughs> hey, that that's, I'm, I'm helping unleash your creativity. I love it. All about that. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you so much, and I do hope you'll come back and give us an update on the next book. Yeah, I'd love the future. You're welcome back anytime. So, thank you all for listening. Have a great day or great night, wherever you are.